praise for our God. Hallelujah. As our online audience joins us, can you just join me in a hand praise for your creator? Hallelujah. For your father. Hallelujah. For your savior. The one who loved you before anybody even knew you existed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The one who gives your life meaning and purpose. Hallelujah. In an otherwise hellbound world. Thank you, God. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Are you tired of worshiping? Hallelujah. Are you tired of clapping your hands? Are you tired of breathing God's oxygen? Huh? Are you tired of those heartbeats that you don't have to think about that he gives you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. When your hand gets tired, you still have a voice. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. If you didn't have a voice, you still have a life to give him. Hallelujah. You still have your attention, your priorities. You can still love on him. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I don't know what got me so excited this morning, but I guess it happens every Sunday. Somehow, some way, I don't plan it. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to have an opportunity. I don't take it for granted. It might be my last time. And it's good to have you all join me in it. Amen. It's good to have you all to clap him, clap for him with me. It's good to hear you lift up your voices. Hallelujah. And praise and in song. Hallelujah. It's good. It feels good. Thank you. 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 Because I'm going to praise him. Thank you for joining me. Hallelujah. Thank you for being my brother. Thank you for being my sister. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of the Lord among his people. Giving him glory. Giving him honor. And giving him praise. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to say praise the Lord and, and, and good morning to everyone. I want to welcome. Amen. Say how, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Hey, ooh, ooh, I said shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Woo, that's a good one. I think Jesus heard that one. Amen. Hallelujah. We got to try to outdo the angels. Amen. 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 And welcome to all of you that are joining us online, whether you're live or you're hearing us later, we're grateful that you stopped on by virtually uh, to join with us this morning. Amen. And as always, we're praying for those on the prayer list, but we have no additions, and that's a blessing. Amen. Amen. Now, happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers. Amen. Let's stand and give a round of applause for all of our mothers. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Happy Mother's Day. Amen. Now, those of you that know me, you know I'm not all about the secular holidays. Amen? Amen. Some preachers are lazy, so they love all those holidays because it gives them, they don't even have to work. All I got to do is tell them something about, you know, being grateful at Thanksgiving. All I have to do is talk about, you know, Jesus being born at Christmas. All I have to do is talk. I don't have to think on Easter. I just talk about, to give the same kind of sermon. But then there are those of us who try our best to, to tell you exactly what God wanted you to hear. Amen. So it's not as much fun and the world doesn't always get it right. But I think when they decided to honor the mothers, I think even the world got it right. Amen. Even the world got it right. Because I, I can tell you, and I say this often, if you really want to understand, if you want to get in tune with, if you want to have a sense of an example of what the love of God is like, then get to know, have some experience either feeling or giving the love of a parent. And there's nothing higher than the, the love of a mother. Amen? Amen. Think about the thoughts that a mother thinks. Imagine, think about the things that a mother does. Think about the sacrifices that she makes, and then you'll start to approximate the love of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we uh, honor all of our mothers this morning on this day. We celebrate you. We honor you. We thank you for who you are and what you do day in and day out and over a lifetime. Amen. Amen. For those that you birthed and those that you didn't. 
Well, today we're going to continue learning from the Gospel of John. Are you all right with that? I didn't declare a series. I don't have a preaching calendar. I'm week to week. What does God want to do? But we are still going to be learning from that amazing Gospel of John, that singular Gospel of John that was not a synopsis of Jesus's life, but it endeavored to tell you who Jesus really was and who Jesus really is. Amen. So we're going to be learning from the gospel of John as we have been. And along the way where the opportunity presents itself, we're going to uh, notice our mothers. We're going to honor our mothers, encourage our mothers, maybe even heal the heart of a mother in the process. Amen. Amen. And, you know, I didn't know what title to give this, but I I want the text to sort of declare itself. But as I looked at the text, and I wasn't designing this around the Mother's Day theme, however, when I looked at the text, here is sort of the subject, here is the the undergirding that sort of stood out to me, if I were to give it a, a name. And that would be unrecognized love and sacrifice. Unrecognized love and sacrifice. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not appreciated. We're not talking about love and sacrifice is not appreciated. We're not talking about love and sacrifice that isn't requited. I mean, in real time, most of the time, the deepest love, the greatest sacrifice in real time is really not recognized. Some love and sacrifice is so meaningful, so deep that we, we just can't hear the good advice in real time. We can't absorb the right information in real time. We cannot accept and receive the deepest and greatest love and sacrifice until sometime later on. Only time and experience can help us to truly recognize what is so awesome in real time that we just can't hear because we can't hear it or we don't want to hear it. And only grace and love can allow you to keep on giving it even when it's not being received. Keep on giving it even when it's not really recognized for what it is. Keep on giving it, not wait for it to be recognized, but to give it anyhow. Does that sound like God? It also sounds like a mother, doesn't it? Amen, amen, amen. So this is what we're going to endeavor to to take out of. We're just going to go based on what the scripture gives us. Amen. What the text gives us. But I believe that you like I like myself, that when we go through it, you're going to see that the, the writer was trying to get us to understand that some love goes unrecognized in real time. Some sacrifice is not really understood for what it is in real time. But give it a little time and and they'll come around. Amen. Hallelujah. And the grace and the mercy of our God is on full display in our text. Let's have a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this moment. I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for these, your people. Lord God, we come to your throne of grace boldly, Lord God, thanking you and praising you for all that you've done for us and also thanking you in advance for what you're going to do for us moving forward. Lord God, we ask that you would speak to us through your word. Touch every person where they need to be touched. Heal every heart, Lord God, that needs to be healed. We thank you and we praise you for all of the many blessings, including this message you're about to give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. And I dare to say I won't be with you very long, but then again, I usually keep my promises. My family will tell you that. But on this one, this is the one that I break routinely, (laughs) amen. Uh, And we're going to be going again to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. And before we're done, we'll also cover just a little bit of chapter 3. Say amen when you have it. It shouldn't be far from last week, amen. Hallelujah. Now, the last time that we were together, um, we learned about, we got to see what I called, what I entitled, the other side of Jesus. Same Jesus, same love, same light, same life-giving Jesus. Just you got to see the other side. You got to see what he's like 
when you disrespect his father's house. You got to see what it's like, what he's like when you take advantage of people based on greed, when you take away the little opportunity that the underside of society gets to have, when you abuse and misuse your power where you should be loving, you'll get to see the other side of Jesus. Same Jesus. There's not a good side and a bad side of Jesus. There's just a side that looks a little scarier when he gets upset Amen. about you mistreating his people. Amen. When you start taking advantage of people and, and, and not giving them the opportunities that you should be giving them. When you get greedy, when you start commercializing his spirituality, when you start thinking about things more than you think about spirituality or the people that you're supposed to be shepherding. When you start focusing on yourself, when you start thinking, you know, God can bless you with increase, but then you get more focused on the increase than the job that he gave you and the people that he gave you to love on. Amen? Amen. So you got to see the other side of Jesus as he stood up and defended the sanctity of his father's house. You got to see the revealing of his heart for his people. And so let's go to verse 16 of the book of St. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 2. And this would be, now we covered all of the Gospels last week and Isaiah, but the, the one Gospel that I want to have us come back to is John. And we're going to focus on the last verse, the key verse, where Jesus is thrown over the tables. He's sent the, you know, the money changers out, the animals out. Amen. I mean, he's told them, you need to get out of here. And in verse 16, uh, it reads this way. And he said unto them that sold the doves, take these things out of here. King James says, hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Make not my father's house a house of commercialism. Make not my father's house a place where you have a profit motive. Make not my father's house a place where those who are beaten down and they come to my father's house and you beat them down some more. Amen. Hallelujah. Now we can imagine now that we've studied this, hopefully now we understand because we really studied it. We can see the scene and not just see Jesus knocking over tables. Hopefully now, because we are learned people, we can see the scene and we actually understand why he did it and who he did it for. Amen. So it wasn't just a temper tantrum, amen? It's easy just to come to that conclusion. But now that we've studied it, we can really understand amen. what he did, not just what he did, but why he did it and who he did it for. And so now let us continue and further our knowledge and understanding. And so we'll look at verse 17. And now that Jesus has made this statement, he's knocked over the tables. He's made a big ruckus, amen, in the name of God. And he said to them that sold doves, those who sold to the least of them, take this stuff out of here. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And so now what we're going to see in these subsequent verses is what was the response to what Jesus did? I don't know what your response is, but the Bible gets to tell us what the response was to Jesus coming into his father's house and acting like it's his father's house. What was the response to the things that he did, the knocking over of the tables. What was the response to the declaration that he made? Get this stuff out of here. You're commercializing what should be spiritual. You're beating down those who should be lifted up. You're taking away from those you should be giving to. You should be serving. You should be making the worship of God easier for them, not harder for them. So what were the reactions to Jesus? And as we look at these reactions, really, it's no different than any reaction we see here. When you hear somebody say something or when you see somebody do something, your reaction is based largely on a couple of things. Both of them represent your biases. What is your agenda? What are you what's the recording that's going on in your 
mind while you listen to them because we are often distracted by our own stuff so we can't really hear the person. What's your agenda? And secondly, how do you see that person in the first place that's saying it? Because the person can say the same thing to a group of people and half of the people hear them one way, then the other person hears them another way because of the bias that they came into it with. And so let's look at verse 17 and see, because we're, we're seeing the response. We know what Jesus did. We know also what he said. And we, because we've studied it, know why he said it. Who he was defending, who he was standing up for, not just a temper tantrum. Amen. Verse 17 reads, and his disciples say that for me and his disciples. That should be a representative of us that his disciples, those who hung with him, those who should know him best, those who have been learning from him. So his disciples remembered that it was written. So his disciples, we know that the, the key was the apostles. They, they weren't church folks. They loved God. They were looking for the Messiah, but they were fishermen of fish, and he made them fishers of men. Amen. But all of them that walked with Jesus, that followed Jesus, disciples remembered that it was written. The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Now, most of us in, in the 21st century in the United States of America in Los Angeles area, larger Los Angeles, California, we don't know what that, that doesn't read right for us, right? The disciples remembered, now we're all excited, that it was written, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. And what I'm suggesting is that we go to where, where this comes from. What was... The scripture, what was the verse, what were the writings that they were referring to? Jesus did these things and it made them think of something. It reminded them of what had been written. So to them, Jesus was reminding them of scripture. And that's a good thing. So let's go to Psalms quickly. Psalm 69. All we're doing here, this is called exegesis. If you want to get into the Greek, we're just breaking it down. We're exposing the scripture for what it is. And if there's another layer, if there's a reference, then let's go to that reference, even if it's not explicitly stated. So we're going to Psalm 69 and 9. Very quickly, it's just one verse. But this is what the disciples were remembering when Jesus did what he did and said what he said. This is what the close people to him thought about which is a reflection of how they saw him and how they processed it. What was their agenda? We want to learn from Jesus. We want to follow Jesus. What was their bias? He is our teacher. He is our leader. He is our Lord. That's how they interpreted what he had to say. So what Jesus did, yes, the tables knocked, were knocked over. He was probably raising his voice. But those who followed him, those who loved him, really heard him. Come on now, I'm talking about somebody's life here. And so verse 9 of Psalm 69, it says, For the zeal, in the, and we don't have time for the context, but go back for yourself and read all of it starting at verse 1. And you'll see what he was working his way up to. But he says here, For the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. And the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen Upon thee. So when we see what Jesus said and did, it matches up with the sentiment of this verse. The zeal of thine house have eaten me up. They've overtaken me. The zeal of thine house, O God. And the reproaches, the wrongdoings, the disrespectful acts of those that reproached thee are fallen upon me. The money changers, the people who ripped the people off. Well, you'd say, well, what? they didn't do anything directly to God, but if they did it to God's house and if they did it to God's people, then they did it to God. If somebody hurts your loved one, they're coming at you. And so you respond in kind, amen? Hallelujah. And so his disciples 
recognize that Jesus' actions were the result of his rightful passion, his rightful love for his God's house. That's how the people who had a bias toward Jesus as opposed to against Jesus. That's what they thought. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, the same words and the same actions, because anything you do and say, it has an audience of folks who have their own mindset, who have their own agenda, who have their own bias, either for or against you. Same words, same actions, just like the other side of Jesus. Same love, same truth, same light shining down. But if you shine on something ugly, you're going to call it pretty. You'll shine on something right, wrong. You're going to call it right. So the same actions, same words, but they triggered a different response from the Jews, meaning the religious folk. Amen. Amen. Now, these folks knew the same scriptures that the disciples knew, but they knew them even better. Technically speaking, they knew the letter of the law. They knew the letter of the writings, but never tapped into or understood or were in tune with the heart and the true meaning of them. They could quote them, but they did not live them. They could quote them, but they did not express the meaning and the purpose. And therefore, they did not invite the people into the truth of them. And so Jesus came with that truth. And it sounded crazy because of what the foundation that had been built before. So he had to relay the foundation. Amen. 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 So they knew the same scriptures and should have known it better. And so what we might hope for here is maybe the learned people, maybe the religious folk seeing Jesus do this and say these things and knowing way more than the disciples who said, "Whoa, that reminds me of a scripture. Maybe they'll say, you know what, Jesus, you know, you're right. You have a point. You know what? Now that you thank you so much, I should have noticed. I should have done something about it. But you thank you for bringing it up. I tell you what, it's so I got it from here. You thrown that stuff out. You've made the point about the people only having these outer courts. You've made the point about how big God's heart is and how big his family is. And it's not just about us as Jews. It's not just about us here in Jerusalem. It's not just about us in southern Israel. It's about all of the people that you love. Thank you for waking me up. Thank you for opening my eyes. Thank you for showing me the full truth. I should have gotten to it. I should have done it. But it's more about getting it right than being right. So thank you so much for pointing that out. I'll take it from here. What you've done once, I will make it the law. I will make it the rule. This will be our modus operandi from now on. We will sell things and the adjacent space, not within the worship space of all of the aliens, all of the visitors, all of the non-Jews that accept our God and want to worship our God. We're not going to get in the way. We're not going to let people take shortcuts. We're not going to let people rip them off. We must do commerce because folks come from other places, but we're not going to have a profit motive in our heart. So thank you. Isn't that what church folks, isn't that what the religious folks should do? Isn't that what we do? Somebody points out a wrong or shortcoming or something we could do better. Don't we say thank you? Hallelujah. Isn't that what we do? <laughs> or are you telling me not much has changed in 2000 years? I think that's what you're telling me. Are you telling me, uh, hey, pastor, you preached it. Our flesh is not saved. <laughs> and so the spirit is supposed to come up against that, right? There should be a fight. Amen. There should be that, you know, your flesh should not be unopposed. And so we'll see, let's see if they said thank you. So we'll go to verse 18 and see the response of the others. We saw that the disciples said, oh, my goodness, that reminds us of a verse of scripture. Verse 18, then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? What sign do you have for us, seeing that you're doing all of these things? So that's not exactly the reaction I was hoping for. How about you? 
So they didn't say thank you. They wanted to know what miracle. I see you doing all this stuff. I see you making a ruckus. I see you taking authority that we would say does not belong to you. I hear what you're saying, but here's what I'm asking you. What sign are you going to show me to prove that you're really from God, that you have the authority that you are now taking? Not even talking about what he said, not even giving it credit, not noticing that it's scriptural. No, what sign? How dare you? Not the fact they didn't get in tune with the fact that what he was doing was right. They were more interested if he had the right. They cared more about procedure than the substance. They cared more about position and role and title than the meaning and the purpose and the people that he was standing up for and the God that he was interceding for. So what miracle are you going to show us? Show me. You got to show me something now so I can know that you really come from God and that God has given you the authority to do what you just did. So so what was their bias? What was their perspective that you think they came into that giving Jesus the benefit of the doubt? No, you need to prove it to me. They came from Missouri. Show me. Where did you get this authority? What sign are you going to show us? That will allow us to go along with this because other than that, we're coming at you. And they completely missed the fact that that he was right (laughs) and why he was doing it. And so if you were to fast forward that to today. And you were to look at the, you know, sort of the flaws and the foibles. Of the church today. Because some would have you to think that we're at our most the pinnacle of Christianity. We've got it so right now. I mean, we're so slick. We're so fancy. I mean, we know how to extract money from people like nothing else. We know how to get people excited by nothing else. We know how to build big cathedrals like they never had. We're at the pinnacle of our spirituality, our spiritual maturity as Christians. We've got it all down. And so if you were to point out what the Bible would say, what God wants us to know about where we are, would we respond any different? So if you're a preacher and you're out there and you're trying to say what I know God is likely telling you about what time it is, and if your assignment is to bring men and women into the heart in the home of God and also help clean up his house, if you have that last part of that assignment, I know that you don't have a lot of takers. I know you don't have a lot of fans. I know that it's not easy because they don't say thank you. They don't say, oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. They passed this. It's not going to say, oh, my goodness, I have this house because I've been doing it this way. I can accept this house doing it the right way. Oh, my goodness, thank you for catching me. Thank you for pulling me back. Thank you for doing what Paul told the churches that he planted and led and taught. Hey, you know what? If if your brother's doing wrong, talk to him in love and bring him on back. Don't let him go over the cliff. Thank you so much. No, we're no different in today's church. We don't want to hear it. And most importantly, this is deep and love and right, full of love and right. So in real time, it's not going to be heard or understood. That's just the way it is. Amen. That's just the way we're made. So now with that background, oh, pastor, that was just the background. Yeah, (laughs) we learned something from it, but it is also background that helps us as we go forward into these next verses. And so let's see what we get to see now. We saw what Jesus did and said, and now we've seen the reaction of those who saw him the right way, who gave him the benefit of the doubt, who didn't have a negative bias toward him, if anything, for him. And then those who were just the opposite. And so now we get to see Jesus' response back. And we go to verse 19. Jesus answered and said, because now they've asked him, what sign do you have to let us know, to make us believe that you have the authority to do this stuff? Because if you don't have the authority, my current baseline bias is to come at you. Because you violated our rules, you violated our processes, our procedures, our hierarchy. And so we're going to come at you. So you need to show us something. And the only thing that's going to hold us back is the crowd of people. So Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. 
Now, the question is, show us a sign. Amen? The request is, show us a sign that you have the authority. Basically, show, show, what sign do you show us, seeing that you do us these things? And Jesus' response is this, destroy this temple in three days and I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 46 years was this temple in the building. It took 46 years to build it. And will you rear it up in three days? But, verse 21, he spake of the temple of his body. Now we know that, right? But we are living after the fact. We have the advantage of living after all of these things. So before we judge all of these folks that are dealing with something that's amazing and awesome and deep in real time, what are you doing with the amazing and awesome and deep stuff in real time? That God is giving you either directly or through someone else. How are you absorbing how are you understanding? How are you interpreting the love that God gives directly or through people that he puts in your life? How are you viewing them? Do you have a positive bias toward them so you really hear? Amen. Or do you have your own movie running, your own audio tape running? Are you thinking about what you came into the conversation believing already and intent on walking away with the same? Amen. Or are you malleable? Are you willing to be changed? Or are you hamstrung by your biases? If there's a woman in the pulpit, can you not hear her? If the person in the pulpit seems younger than you think they ought to be to have the maturity to preach or teach you to you, are you hamstrung by that? Are you biased? Or do you already know everything? So you can't hear everything. You were born on a church pew. You've been in every single auxiliary. You've run a church before. So you, you can't tell me nothing. What are you walking into your real time, deep love, advice, information, wisdom? How are you responding? And so... Jesus says, here's my response. Here's a sign I'll give you now. He says, destroy this temple. And we don't know. The narrative doesn't say whether he pointed to his body or not. But what he said was, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. And they said, How, this, this place took 46 years to build. What in the world are you talking about? How are you going to rear it back up in three days? But of course, we know he was talking about his body. So if they were looking for a sign, I want you to think about it. Go through your Rolodex. Go through your reference. Amen? And you tell me if there's any other sign, any other response that would have been more meaningful, more powerful than the sign that he described. He, they said, what sign are you going to show us to let us know you have the authority? Well, I'll, I'll give you a sign, all right. You kill this body and I'll raise it up in three days. He gave them the best answer they could possibly hear. The best answer. But the answer was spiritual. And the answer wasn't going to happen immediately. And we tend to think of things in a carnal sense, even when we're Christians and we bias, we're biased toward the immediate. We need it now. Show me now, God. <laughs> Encourage me now. Give me the sign now. Make it easy for me now. And I'll believe it. But if I have to wait, if I have to be patient, if I have to hold on. A little while longer if I have to have faith because the substance isn't there physically in my hand. So I've got to go to Hebrews 11. If I got to exercise that, I don't know about it. So we're not surprised at this because we're talking about right. We're talking about the Jews. We're talking about the religious folk, the folk that we always get to beat up on. The you know, Pharisees, the scribes, those folks in the Bible that we get to use as our punching bag. So the question now, which is more important because this isn't a surprise. Well, what did the disciples think? Let's go to that. And for that, we go to verse 22. 
It reads, when therefore he was risen. So we've gone straight from the fact that he said it and then they interpret it as the building because they didn't get the spirituality of it. We know and the writer knew after the fact that he was talking about his body. Verse 22 says, then therefore he was sorry, when therefore he was risen from the dead. Is this after the fact? This is way after the fact. His disciples, what? Remembered. That he had said this unto them and they believed what? The scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, we're talking about the disciples now, right? We're not talking about the religious folks. We're talking about the ones who saw Jesus in a good light. And Jesus' actions in the temple actually gave them a positive scriptural reference. A place to put his actions in words that were constructive and built out of love and passion for God and his people. They had a positive place in their minds and in their hearts to put that. These are the people that we're talking about here. So even those people that Jesus spent time with who were literally trying to listen to him. He had told them this very truth about his arrest, his death, the form of his death, his burial and resurrection. He had told them this loving, deep truth so many ways. And despite all that effort, they still couldn't really hear him or understand. Do you have that testimony? Maybe any mothers have that testimony. In real time, you tell your children or you tell those that you mother that may not be your children the things that they should know. And you tell them every which kind of way and they still can't hear you. They still want to do the thing that they plan to do before they came to you, not asking for your opinion. But you see and you feel like you need to do something to keep them from getting hit by that car. And so you give them the best advice they could ever hear because your past is longer than their past and their present. You have more experiences behind you. Amen. Amen. But they cannot hear you. Even if they're predisposed toward you, they still may not hear you in real time. They still may not hear your admonitions as love. They will see it as limitations. They will see it as you being a killjoy. They will see it as you putting water on their parade and on their parade, dampening their fire. You're trying to tell them in love. Please, baby, please. I see what you don't see. I see what you don't want to see. I see where you are. You're struggling. I'm trying to help you. Or you're not struggling and you should be. I'm giving you this in love. It's not what you want to hear. It's what you need to hear. And I'm telling you this way. I'll tell you that way. I told you this day. I wait a while. Wait for a moment. Wait for an angle. Tell you again. You still can't hear me. You still don't understand. Satan is still giving you the fleshly negative angle on what I'm saying. And I couldn't be laying more sacrificially for you right now. Amen. Amen. And so even those who knew him well, and I could just imagine Jesus, just like Philip did to that that Ethiopian eunuch, and and he was reading Isaiah 53, and he didn't understand it. I could just imagine Jesus breaking it down. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I could just imagine Jesus breaking that down. And still... (laughs) So you heard that. Now let me tell you what's going to happen to me. Do you see any similarities? No. Nope. Still looking for the Messiah that's going to get us away from those Romans. I love all the spirituality, Jesus, but when are we going to whip out the swords? 
Peter. I love all this spiritual stuff, man. You are the man. We're following you because we're about to, it's about to, we're about to throw down. In the name of Jesus. Think about the Old Testament, the banner of the Lord, right? We go to war and God goes before us and we win the battle. We're just trying to still do that. So Jesus came with something different that was deeper, longer lasting, eternal. They could not hear it because they were steeped in the now and the past that they knew. They were not open to the lawgiver. They were too busy being expert in the letter of the law. And it added to adding to it, putting more burden on it so that they can control the people. And Jesus came to release them, right? He gave them to, he brought, he brought the truth and the truth, the truth will what? Set you free. So it wasn't until Jesus had been crucified, buried, and raised from the dead that they finally understood. Now I want to talk to all of you all, not as the mother, but as the child of a mother. Have you had an aha moment? Have you had that moment? I'm going to just tell you, those moments start to come at age 25 or thereabouts. Huh. Oh, she was right. I've been slapped around, beaten down. I'm steeped in debt. My heart's been broken. Maybe I've gotten a couple children of my own by now. Bless the Lord. Whatever it is that's happened, Ah, experience in time. Did what mama try really hard, but she couldn't accomplish. She gave it all that she had. Oh, man. Huh, now I see. Or maybe you're blessed to have, indeed have children, right? At whatever age. Hopefully you're married, but it's not always that way. I want you to think about how you feel about your children. I want you to think about the thoughts that you think while they're asleep, when they get into devilishment, the thoughts that you think when you try to stop them from doing something that they shouldn't do and they think you're a killjoy and all you're trying to do is make sure that they're safe. When you give them advice about their lives and the decisions they're going to make, all you're trying to do is save them heartache, frustration, pain. That's all you're trying to do. That's all you're trying to do, but they can't hear you. In fact, maybe more than they can't hear you, maybe you become the enemy. Maybe you're the one they don't call anymore. Maybe you're the one they no longer come to because the people in their peer group know better and love them more. The internet knows better and loves them more. The chat room knows better and loves them more. All their followers know better and loves them more. The preacher that tells them that they're the best thing since sliced bread and, they, and God owes them everything knows better and loves them more. Of course, it feels better to be told that you should want and you will have everything that you ever thought you should have when you should have it and that whatever God thinks, the one who really loves you is supposed to agree with you and just facilitate it. And that's their picture of love. But true love, the deepest kind of love, the sacrificial love that gives and becomes the enemy because it's worth at least trying for the one that you love. Become the enemy. Only for giving the truth in love. Amen? Amen. So Jesus had told them every which way that he could, and it wasn't until after his death, burial, resurrection, and resurrection that they understood. Only after the fact. And so I would imagine that our mothers, that this resonates with you, amen? Because that's just the way we are. Loving intentions will not cause someone to hear you. Did you know that? All of you mothers and that are mothering and fathering folks that are, that are trying to mentor and teach and care for folks, telling them what they really want to hear. Can I just tell you, newsflash, loving intentions will not on their own penetrate. Amen. And what are the chances that later on they're going to come back and say, you know what, you told me 
not to do that. You see this knot on my head? Yeah. You told me not to do that. You know what? You told me to go that way, and now I can imagine what might have been. And I just wanted to come back and say thank you. I just wanted to let you know I thank you for your prayers. I thank you for all the love that you had. That must have been hard. I'm grown now. That must have been so hard because I now have people in my life I'm trying to mentor. I now have children. That must have been, I'm just imagining. I know what I was like. I know how I responded. I know the looks I gave you. I know the things I said to your face and behind your back. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm so sorry. I see now. Loving intentions won't do it. It's great to have them. It's the great to come packing that. But they won't do it. Amen? Amen. Nor will the number of ways that you try to come at it. <laughs> you can try it every which way. You can give a speech. You can take away stuff. You can do anything you want. But if you're competing with their own agenda, if you're competing with those like in the Garden of Eden that have a better narrative for them, yeah. that fits what they want, Amen. if it doesn't, if the timing of what you're saying doesn't fit with what their flesh wants, the loving intentions and all the tactics and ways, you tried it this way, then you said you were tired, you ain't going to try it no more, then you get a little energy, so you come another way, or you think a little bit of time has gone by, maybe that's enough, maybe they'll hear me this time, mama, I know you get tired, thank God, Jesus didn't. Thank God he didn't. Time and experience will reveal those things to them. Amen? Amen. And grace and love is what overcomes it and allows you, just like God, to give even when it's not being received yeah. in real time. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So now, as we've couched that, let's skip on quickly to chapter 3. I hope that this text is teaching you something, and I hope that you see the parallels with motherhood. I'm sure you're thinking about some conversations you've had or some things that you've done that just were not embraced for what they were in real time. So let's look at chapter 3, and we see the Jewish leader Nicodemus, and he was part of likely of the Sanhedrin. He was certainly part of the Jewish leadership and he didn't want to be and he didn't want it to be known that he was going to Jesus so he went to Jesus at night secretly and he said this and it says this in verses 1 through 3 there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him rabbi we know that thou art a teacher Come from God. Isn't this a great change from what we just heard? For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. I'm real curious about what he was going to say after that, but Jesus didn't let him say it. Jesus stopped him and cut straight to the chase. In verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So this man started out giving Jesus a little bit of credit, and we don't know what he was going to say after that. But before he could get to it, Jesus went straight to his real point. And so he tells him about the kingdom of God. Unless a man can be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus did the same thing that all of the spiritual leaders did. He only saw the temporal and the carnal. He only imagined the physical. He could not see the spiritual. So he didn't even fathom that you could be spiritually born again. That you could have a metanoia instead of a metameloma. So he did not understand because what Jesus was talking about was spiritual. Now I'm going to take just a moment 
And I want to talk to the mothers. He didn't understand because it was spiritual. The folks that you're trying to teach, the folks that you're trying to love, the folks that you're trying to advise won't understand because it is either spiritual or they just can't see it like we can't see spiritual things. They cannot see it because you are seeing the future because you've got that all in your past. You want them to have the benefit of your experience and knowledge. They want to go through it themselves. They don't want the bad parts, but they can only see the good parts of their own opinion right now. So I know you're giving it, but they won't be able to receive it. Just like they could, he couldn't see it. Just like they couldn't see it because it was spiritual. Are you hearing me? Nicodemus could not get it, even though Jesus tried to help him. And we won't go through all of the conversation. We've covered that before about how can you go into the mother's womb and come right and come back out? I just don't get it. But well, you got to be born of the water and the spirit. Well, I still just don't get that. He just couldn't understand it. So even after all the explanation, he said, how can those things be? <laughs> and so he didn't get it. And so let's pick it on up at verse 11. And I'm coming close to landing the plane. For those of you who are a little bit tired and, and, are, and are judging me, you said you're going to be shorter today. I told you in advance that that's the one thing. <laughs> I'm not very reliable. I'm reliable in general. Talk to the people who know me. Amen. Amen. Verily, verily, verse 11, verily, verily, Jesus said, verily, verily, Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say unto thee, we speak Sorry, we speak that we do know. We've been trying to tell you the stuff that we know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. If I had told you earthly things, if I have told you, or meaning really saying since I've told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Mm -mm -mm. Isn't that something? We've been trying to explain these things to you, and you just cannot hear us. And in verse 13, this is one of those verses that can get you. You'd be like, what? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. That one can be hard to understand. So just bear with me and forgive me for not keeping the kind of half promise that I gave you about being brief because we are exegeting. We are exposing the scripture. So you leave here knowing everything that God has blessed me to know about this. So let's quickly go to Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30, because Jesus says, and no man is, ha hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. He wasn't just babbling. He wasn't just talking. He was again referring to the word of God. The last time it was Psalms that the disciples remembered. But now we're going to Proverbs 30. And we're going to quickly look at verse four. I won't keep you there long where it reads who hath the symbol, excuse me, ascended up to heaven or descended. Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. He wasn't just babbling. He was actually saying something. Amen. So this this particular scripture, now that we know where it came from, it makes it clearer for us. He's saying, I know you can't understand it. And who hath ascended and descended? We can't ascend to heaven and learn firsthand and get the full understanding of these deeper things and then bring them back. So we couldn't go to heaven. So heaven and the creator came to us. I know Nicodemus I'm not judging you I know you can't get it 
Because my own disciples can get it. And if you can go there, go to heaven, couldn't you just imagine? Even now, those who are going to hell, if they could be transformed to heaven and realize, uh-oh, or if they could be taken to hell, and oh my God, this is real. Like that wealthy man that wouldn't give Lazarus the, you know, the crumbs off, it, off his table. If you could know after the fact, if you could go back and live your life, if you could learn your lessons in reverse, would you do anything differently? So you cannot ascend to heaven and get it firsthand and bring those deeper things back. So heaven came to you in the form of Jesus, the word, the creator became flesh and dwelt among you and then took the beating and then took the loneliness and then took all the name calling. And then went on trial and then hung on that cross and had the time and the wherewithal to forgive one on the cross next to him and encourage him that today you'll be with me in paradise while he can't hardly breathe. So heaven came to us. Come on now. Doesn't that sound like a, I know you're not hearing me, but so I'm going to jump in there. And be in that thing with you. Because I've been there. <laughs> Lord have mercy. So heaven came to us. The creator came to us. Isn't that some awesome love? Talk about empathy. Come on now. I know what it's like to be in your shoes. He came down. To, and, and experienced what we feel. All right. And so this very son of man, I'm going to move on so I can close land this plane. Verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so I want you to picture he lifted up a stick, right? And it became a serpent. He lifted up a piece of wood, a bough from a tree. So just as Moses did that in the wilderness, in the desert, even so must the son of man be lifted up. How clear is that? It should be crystal clear that whosoever believeth in him should not what perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. You theologians now, you now have the context and the scriptural Old and New Testament understanding of the most quoted scripture in the Bible. You now have the full foundation, thrust and meaning and understanding and context for God so loved the world. Heaven came to you because you couldn't go to it. He didn't wait for you to understand it, let alone appreciate it before he found himself yet doing it. If you had to wait for somebody to appreciate and understand the depth of what you're trying to offer them, you would never give it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God looked beyond our faults and our limitations to understand and embrace the deeper things, to embrace his plan, to embrace the depth of his love. The fact that his grace and mercy caused him to love us before we could even appreciate and understand what he was giving us. And he saw our need. Jesus left the throne of heaven and sacrificed himself to bridge the gap between us and our God. Amen. Amen. Why? The Bible tells us why. Because he does not want us to perish. Amen. Nobody that loves somebody else wants to see them suffer. Amen. He wants the best for us. That's why he gives us the limitations. I'm going to say that three times. He wants the best for us. That's why he gives us the do's and the don'ts. He wants the best for us. That's why he showed us the way instead of giving us a way and a deck of cards and letting us choose. Because we have one out of 52 chances of being wrong. Or rather, we have 53 out of, 51 out of 52 chances of being wrong. He doesn't want us to perish. This is why he gave us the way, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he sacrificed, he sacrificed, he sacrificed 
so that we can have that way, so that we can have the best outcome possible. So moms, you probably can identify with this, and then I'll go to my last verse, verse 17, because there's something that comes after 316. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever uh, believeth in him uh, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus came telling us what's best for us, steering us away from the worst outcomes. That's what, that's what he came to do, and that was out of pure love. But many see it as condemnation when Jesus tells us the truth, just like people will hear your words as condemnation when you're just trying to tell them what's right. We see it as God not supporting. We wanna, we wanna live out our dreams. We're smart, we have gifts, so why can't we do it our way? Why can't there be many ways to God? So people will see what you have to say, mothers, as a lack of support when you offer them the best. They will see it as you not wanting them to experience happiness or profit when you're giving them the best and telling them the truth. They will see it as taking all the fun out of life. That's how people see Christianity, just a bunch of rules and regulations. Why can't we enjoy this one short life? Turn that thing around, this life, this life is short. Why not invest in the long one? If you love somebody, isn't that what you tell them? But Satan planted a seed, and we buy, and we eat that pl the, the plant that grows from that seed and focus on just the little thing that we can see now instead of eternally. Amen? Amen. Amen? Taking all the fun out of it. And then the last thing I'll say is they might, mothers, see your advice, your imposition, your imposing yourself into their goings on as an attempt to just control them. You're just controlling, mama. That's all you're doing. You just want to control me. 18 isn't old enough. You still want to control my life. You still want to run things. That's all you're trying to do. And so this is the lie that Satan said to Eve, amen? amen. He's just trying to be the boss of you. He just don't want you to have a mind of your own. He doesn't want you to have know all the stuff that the gods have. He's trying to stay superior to you. He's actually holding you down. He's keeping you down. You're trying to be loyal to him? No, 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 no. I got something for you. He's trying to hold back. He's trying to keep you away from stuff. I'm trying to give you stuff. So this shouldn't surprise us. This mischaracterization started early on in the garden. And so, mothers, if you've experienced these challenges, let me just say today, encourage you that you're in good company. <laughs> And so let's just thank Jesus. I am landing the plane. I didn't get into the destination when the ticket said, <laughs> but I got you there safely. And I got you there with the truth. And I got you there with more love than you, than you came in here with, amen? So thank Jesus today for looking beyond our faults and all of our limitations and seeing our needs and sacrificing himself on the cross and not waiting for us to fully understand it. And let's also thank all of the mothers uh, for your loving guidance and your personal sacrifices that you have made and are probably still making. And I hope that today you will be blessed uh, with a wonderful day with special attention and appreciation and maybe, just maybe, somebody will hear a message today that will cause them to go and tell mama, you know what, thank you, and go and tell mama, you know what, I'm sorry, and go and tell mama, I understand now. She ain't gonna beat you up. She's not gonna throw it in your face. But if you wanna give her flowers while she can smell them, many times that's what the flower looks like. It's just so that she can know that it wasn't in vain. Amen. Amen. So let's honor God and let's honor our mothers on this special day. Amen. And to God be the glory. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Lord. And um, Pastor Trina, before we go, I know that we gave the carnations to, okay, all right, I'll leave it. 